Linear relationships are all around us. They can be seen in everything from how we move and what we do to what we've made and who we are. In this video, we'll explore ways of modeling a linear relation, and we'll take a look at how all of these representations are connected. To do so, we'll consider the real-life example of how an aircraft climbs after taking off and how it descends when returning to the airport. And what could possibly be a better location for our investigation than the inside of an airplane? I'm here at the Brantford Municipal Airport where I'm about to jump into this Cessna 152 and investigate how it makes its way from the ground to cruising altitude. But before I hop in and take to the skies, we need to quickly talk about what we mean when we say altitude. The word altitude simply refers to the height of an object. In aviation, two types of altitude are commonly used to describe how high an airplane is in the sky. First, we have the altitude above ground level, or AGL, which is the aircraft's height above the ground at its current location. Second, we have the altitude above sea level, or ASL. This altitude describes the plane's height in reference to the average level of the Earth's bodies of water. It's important to note that different geographic locations have different elevations with respect to sea level. For example, the city of Brantford and the Brantford Airport have an elevation of 815 feet above sea level. As a plane cruises, its altitude above ground level will change depending on the terrain below, but its altitude above sea level remains the same. The instrument inside the plane that measures the aircraft's altitude is called an altimeter. Note that the altimeter measures the plane's altitude above sea level. As we've seen, the Brantford Airport is 815 feet above sea level. So even though this airplane is sitting on the ground right now, the altimeter still shows an altitude of 815 feet. So for our investigation of how this aircraft climbs, we have an initial altitude, or a start value, of 815 feet. The only other piece of information that we need for our relationship is the rate at which the aircraft climbs. After lifting off the runway, we'll be able to see this rate of climb on an instrument called the Vertical Speed Indicator. This instrument, often referred to as the VSI, tells us the number of feet that the aircraft is climbing or descending every minute. And now it's time to leave the Earth. Ramp traffic, Zulu Juliet, Foxtrot lining up runway 23, you'll be climbing to 3,000 feet, making a left hand turn, departing to the south. At this point, I've left the runway and the vertical speed indicator shows that I'm climbing at a rate of 500 feet per minute. Now that we have our initial altitude of 815 feet and our rate of 500 feet per minute, let's take a look at some of the ways we can model the relationship between altitude and time. One of the easiest ways to describe our relationship is to use a word description. We know that the starting altitude was 815 feet and the rate of climb was 500 feet per minute. So we could simply say, an aircraft has an initial altitude of 815 feet above sea level and climbs at a rate of 500 feet per minute. We can also model our relationship using a table of values. Since we're modeling altitude, we'll label our right-hand column altitude. And because the altitude depends on how much time has passed, we'll label our left-hand column, which is the independent variable, time. For our first value, we can use our initial altitude of 815 feet. That is, at a time of zero, the altitude is 815 feet. We need to decide the increment that we'll use in the time column. Let's keep things simple and go up one minute at a time. To find our next value in the altitude column, recall that the plane is climbing at 500 feet per minute. So the altitude that corresponds to a time of one minute can be found by adding 500 to our initial altitude of 815 feet. This gives us a value of 1,315 feet. Similarly, for a time of two minutes, another minute has passed, so we can simply add another 500 feet. 
This gives us a value of 1,815 feet. Continuing this way, we can complete the table. Now let's take a look at a graphical representation. Again, because we're modeling altitude, we'll label our vertical axis, which is our dependent variable axis, altitude. And because this altitude depends on time, we'll label our horizontal axis, or our independent variable axis, time. We know that our initial altitude is 815 feet, so at a time of zero, we can plot a point at 815 feet on the vertical axis. To get the next point on the graph, recall that as every minute passes, the aircraft climbs another 500 feet. So if we move over to the right one minute, which on this graph corresponds to one square, our next point can be found up 500 feet. On this graph, that corresponds to two squares. For the next point, we can do the same thing. Move over one minute and up 500 feet. That is over one square and up two squares. Continuing to follow this pattern gives us several more points on the graph. Finally, we can draw a straight line through all of these points to model our continuously changing altitude. And last but not least, let's take a look at an equation representation for this situation. We're modeling altitude, so let's start our equation with a variable or a letter that's appropriate for altitude. We'll use A. We have an initial altitude of 815 feet, and we know that this value is increasing over time, so we need to add something. How much do we add? Well, the aircraft's altitude is increasing by 500 feet every minute, so we need to add 500 multiplied by the number of minutes that have passed, which we'll represent using the variable t. Keep in mind that it's very common to write this equation with the rate first and the initial value at the end. Note that these two equations represent the exact same relationship. So there they are, four ways of representing the relationship between altitude and time for the climbing aircraft. Notice that our two key values appear in all of these representations. Specifically, each representation displays a start value of 815 feet and a rate of 500 feet per minute. Let's take a look at each of these in turn. Our start value of 815 feet is explicitly stated in the word description. Looking at our table of values, we also see a start value of 815 feet. And we know that this is the start value because it corresponds to a time of zero minutes. Moving over to the graph, we can also see our start value of 815 feet on the vertical axis, again corresponding to a time of zero minutes. And finally, looking at our equations, we see our initial altitude of 815 feet as the constant in the equation. That is, it's the number that does not have the variable attached to it. And lastly, let's take a look at how our rate of 500 feet per minute appears in each of our relationships. Again, in the word description, this number is explicitly stated as the rate. In our table of values, our rate of 500 feet per minute showed up as the first differences. That is, the value that we added to the altitude for each additional minute of time. In our graphical representation, the rate of 500 feet per minute showed up as the amount by which the graph increased with every passing minute of time. And finally, in our equations, our rate of 500 feet per minute shows up as the number that is multiplied by the time variable. I'm now cruising at an altitude of 3,000 feet and it's time to get back down to the airport. Looks like our rate of descent is 500 feet per minute. Let's quickly look at how our models change when we talk about descending instead of climbing. Our word description will change slightly for the descending aircraft. Specifically, we now need to use an initial altitude of 3,000 feet instead of 815 feet, and a rate of descent of 500 feet per minute instead of a rate of climb of 500 feet per minute. For our table of values, we can still use one minute increments in the time column. Now our initial altitude will be 3,000 feet. And we know that for each additional minute, the altitude decreases by 500 feet. So, to move from our initial altitude to the next row in the table, we need to subtract 500. 
we can continue this pattern to complete the table. Moving on to our graphical representation, we can plot our initial altitude of 3,000 feet on the vertical axis. Since the aircraft is now descending, this time when we move over one minute on the graph, we need to move down 500 feet, which corresponds to the distance covered by two squares on this graph. We can continue this pattern and draw our straight line to complete the graph. And finally, let's take a look at our equation model for this relationship. Again, we'll use A to represent altitude. We know that our initial altitude is 3,000 feet, but this time our altitude is decreasing over time, so we must subtract something. Since the rate of descent is 500 feet per minute, we'll subtract 500 multiplied by the number of minutes that have passed, which we'll represent with the letter T. Once again, keep in mind that we can rewrite this equation starting with the rate on the right-hand side, followed by the initial altitude. As we saw when modeling our climbing aircraft, our two key values show up in each of these four representations. Specifically, in each representation we see a start value of 3,000 feet and a rate of negative 500 feet per minute. Notice that this rate is a negative value because the aircraft is descending or decreasing in altitude. Traffic Zulu Juliet Foxtrot turning final runway 23 full stop. Touchdown! That was fun. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.